plenty. Just two more hours on John to endure for you. Uh, for you to endure, as you say. John chapter 20. And if you've got your notes, I mean, your outline, we've had to mess, I'm afraid, John 14, 15, and 16, but if you've got your outline, we're at the last part now, and uh, chapter 20 is under a heading, The Triumph of Divine Love. And uh, then there's the epilogue, chapter 21. So tonight, hopefully, we'll get through John chapter 20, and on Wednesday, at the same hour, John chapter 21. I think the best thing this evening is to go through this chapter in the sections into which I've divided it in your outline. Have you got that with you? The Great Discovery, verses 1 through 10. Love Rewarded, verses 11 through 18. Peace for Fear, verses 19 through 23, certainty for doubt, verses 24 to 29, and the purpose of the record, verses 30 and 31. So we'll just take it through under those headings, if we may, and we'll read those verses as we come to each different heading. So we'll start in chapter 20 now, and I'll read verses 1 through 10. John chapter 20 reading in the RSV. Right? Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have led him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying, and the napkin, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. <laughs> then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their home. This is the word of the Lord. A wonderful chapter. <clears throat> First ten verses are called The Great Discovery. The people who are really ready for the resurrection of Jesus were Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John the disciple whom Jesus loved. Ye three, really prepared. And the signs which prepared them here are the open sepulchre and the grave clothes. Mary sees the first of these, the open sepulchre, and the men see the others. Look at what Mary saw. What wonderful verses, first two verses of this are. How spontaneous, how passionate. Let me read them again, just to check what she saw. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon, Peter, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, 
they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him in those few words how much is said do you notice about the time early in the morning before, before dawn while it was still dark incidentally could I say that early morning appointments with Jesus hold secrets for those who are there with him early morning appointments with Jesus hold secrets for those who are there with him she was there before the dawn the time and the place and the fact of an empty tomb and the effect and her testimony see all those things in the first two verses time place fact effect testimony see if you can trace them the first evidence of the resurrection was given to the one who loved Jesus so much in fact well enough to be at the tomb before sunrise I'll come back to that in a moment notice what Peter and John saw verses 3 through 10 when Mary ran and reported to them they ran toward the sepulchre that Easter morning love in the person of John went faster than enthusiasm Peter had run him beat him to it I can imagine those two fellows covering, covering the ground can't you and that's Sabbath morning a nip in the air I'm sure there's a light in their eye and wonder in their heart amazement I said that uh, love beat enthusiasm but uh, it was enthusiasm that went right into the tomb to look verses 6 and 8 however the race went on and love continued and you notice love was the first to believe verse 8 they saw the linen cloths lying and the napkin which had been on his head not lying with the linen cloths but rolled up and appraised by itself lying that is still in the original fold lying still in the original fold untouched by human hands but no longer containing the body lying repeat that still in their original fold untouched by human hand but no longer containing the crucified body of Jesus they saw that and John saw it and believed first eight the great discovery now second here love rewarded Mary stood verse 11 weeping outside the tomb and as she wept she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head and one at the feet they said to her woman why are you weeping she said to them because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him saying this she turned round and saw Jesus standing but she did not know that it was Jesus Jesus said to her woman 
Why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and said to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Some of the details in those verses are only recorded in John's Gospel. There are some things for our thought here. Verses 11 through 15, look at her love and her sorrow. Verses 11 through 14, she stood weeping at the tomb. Look at her sorrow. And then in verse 16, look at Jesus' revelation of herself, of himself. Mary's sorrow and her love. And then Jesus reveals himself and said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him, in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher or master. And you notice the twofold command, verses 17 and 18, do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Do not hold me. Why? Don't touch me. It's a very strong word. Wrote out in... Uh, a translation which says, Stop touching me. The reason the Lord gives is that he has not yet ascended to his Father. And for that event, the ascension of Jesus, she must begin to prepare by ceasing to cling too closely to the physical form of her Master. Notice that. Could I just repeat that to you? Because it's important, just by the way, to get that down. Why did Jesus say, don't touch me? She was learning, had to learn something. He hadn't ascended to his father. She must begin to prepare for that. When he would leave her physically. Therefore, she mustn't cling too closely to the physical. Begin to trust the spiritual. And he then commissions her to declare to his disciples his ascension. You notice in verse 27, just glance ahead of that, will you? Verse 27, he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Don't be faithless, but believing. That was the only evening of the same day. Jesus hadn't ascended into heaven. Why did he say to one, don't touch me? Do you have it? Stretch out your hand. Well, it's a different word. One to me used to me, stop clinging to me. The other, a word that simply means a touch. A touch. Quite different. An invitation to touch him. You want evidence? Touch me. Look at my hand, it's in my side. Such a hand into it and see. 
A suggestion if they want evidence, just that, to be sure. But to Mary, a danger that she clung to the Lord Jesus. Hadn't learned to trust the spiritual Christ. But there's something else about um, his appearance to Mary that we must look at, which I think is very wonderful. And you don't get it in John. Mark's gospel account is Mark 16 and verse 9. Mark 16 verse 9 says, When he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Now just hold it a minute. What an opportunity to stand before Pontius Pilate as the risen Lord. What an opportunity to go to the Roman political authority and stand before them. But he didn't. He didn't. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene and Mark goes on to remind us out of whom he had cast seven demons. A resurrection priority. Jesus showed himself first to Mary out of whom he'd cast seven demons because go slow write this down ready go the first significant long word S-I-G-N-I-F-I-C-A-N-C-E the first significance important thing of his resurrection was to prove his authority in spiritual realm. To prove his authority in the spiritual realm over all forces of evil. His resurrection had struck at the root Out of this woman, Jesus had cast seven demons. I'll repeat. The first significance of the resurrection was to prove his authority in the spiritual realm of all forces of evil. His resurrection had struck at the root. He cast out of that woman seven demons. And as a result, she responded to him with all her love. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Now, hold that word appeared <clears throat> circle it round ring it round underline it now you are studying the epistle to the Hebrews aren't you? well you have been? yeah have you got as far as chapter 9? no alright I'll just get it in front for one minute and ask you to look at chapter 9 a moment Not to intrude where angels might fear to tread. Right hand. Just to support Billy. Hebrew, is it Billy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Hebrews chapter 9. Look, and ring round the word here. Look. Verse 24. 24, right? Hebrews 9, 24. Christ has entered not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, that to heaven itself now to appear, circle that word, in the presence of God on our behalf. Verse 26. For then, then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world, but as it is, he has, a, has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself he has appeared circle the word there 
Verse 26. Verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. It's a very interesting word because none of those words are the words that Mark uses. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Hebrews 9.24 He has entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God. And that means the word means literally to give information. The word is emphasized, but you don't need to put it down. Uh, it's the word from which we get emphasis. To give information. To appear in the presence of God on our behalf. In verse 26, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin. The word is evidence. To give evidence that he has put away sin. And then in verse 28, Christ will appear a second time, a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. He will appear. He will be seen. It's the word from which we get optician, optical. He'll be seen, literally seen, a second time. But none of those are the word that John uses, that Mark uses. You've got those three just as a matter of interest, so that you have a note of that when you come perhaps to that chapter in Hebrews. Hebrews 9.24, the word is to appear, to give information. Emphasis. I'll give you the word if you like. E-M-P-H-A-N-I-Z-O-Z-O. -O. It doesn't really matter. To give information. Hebrews 9.26 He has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin. Evidence. He's accomplished it. And the third word, Christ will appear a second time, will be seen, literally, up to my to those who are eagerly waiting for him. Well, if those are not the word in John, what's his word? It's a word which means shine. Literally, it's shine. It's the same word that you have in Revelation 1.16 when John on Patmos saw the risen Lord and his face was like the sun shining in its full strength. That's the word. You find it again in Revelation 21, 23. Revelation 21, 23. The city has no need of the sun or moon to shine upon it. Revelation 21, 23. That was the word he appeared he shone first to Mary Magdalene a great blazing light in our heart he shone same word in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 God who said let light shine of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's it. He appeared like that. Not to give information or evidence, but a tremendous revelation of his power. Now, did you get those verses? Just you have a wonderful, wonderful little Bible study all on your own with those verses. Find them again. Quickly, Hebrews 9, 24, now to appear in the presence of God, to give information. Hebrews 9, 26, he appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin, evidence, to put away sin. Hebrews 9, 28, Christ will appear a second time, will be seen a second time. 
But the word here in Mark 16, he shone. Shone. Same word as Revelation 1.16. His face like the sun shining in full strength. Revelation 21, 23. The city has no need of the sun or moon to shine upon it. Its lamp is the Lamb. But when Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, he shone like a blazing light into her heart. That's what you need. That's what I need. He has commanded light to shine out of darkness. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 has shone in our hearts to give the light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Not to give me evidence or information, but a tremendous, dynamic power, a mighty revelation of his power. And he's been doing it ever since in lines like Mary's. It encourages me, he tells me this. And maybe we all just need reminding of it that Jesus is greater than all our sin. And that kind of deliverance is, is sufficient for the worst of us. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Right? Love rewarded. Rewarded with a tremendous in shining of glory in our heart. And then peace replaces fear. Verses nineteen to twenty three. On the evening of that day, that is um, Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, <coughs> the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, <clears throat> Again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven if you retain the sins of any they are returned one or two important things to notice in those verses I've headed them peace replaces fear see these disciples were hiding in Jerusalem the Lord comes to them through shut doors stands in the midst and says, peace, verse 19. He was, his body wasn't a kind of phantom body. It was a resurrected body, spiritual body. And his appearance to them is just, as he t tells it here, is told us in such a way that it's a fulfillment of the promises he made before the Calvary. He imparts his peace. Chapter 14, 27. My peace I give to you. As the world giveth, give I unto you. My peace. John 14, 27. Here it says, peace be to you. Verse 11 through 18 was in the morning. Verse 19 to 23 was in the evening. Verse 11 to 18, one person, Mary, Verse 19 to 23, the rest of the disciples. One Easter Sunday morning out in the open. Two the evening behind closed doors. They're all shut in for fear of the Jews. Notice closed doors, people afraid. Thomas departed. Disciples began to fall apart. 
when Jesus came. And verse 20, the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. The presence of Jesus always changed his fear to joy. Now, what does verse 22 mean? Ooh. Here we come with all the theological discussions and arguments. Verse 22, when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive you the Holy Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit come before Pentecost? No. At Pentecost, he came to indwell. Well, what can this mean? Westcott. He suggests a suggestion. This was the gift of the Holy Spirit the power of the new life proceeding from the person of the risen Lord in anticipation of his indwelling at Pentecost. Think that one through. i give it to you again. Westcott's commentary suggests this is a gift of the Holy Spirit, the power of the new life proceeding from the person of Christ of the risen Christ in anticipation of his indwelling at Pentecost. Notice something else here. Verse 23 If you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any they are retained. i go slowly for a couple of sentences important right Jesus gives his disciples authority Jesus repeating gives his disciples authority publicly to declare forgiveness of sin in his name publicly to declare or to declare publicly as you like <coughs> forgiveness of sin in his name to repentant believers and condemnation to unbelievers repeating Jesus gives to his disciples authority publicly to declare forgiveness of sins in his name to repentant believers and condemnation to unbelievers. It's not a question of deciding who will be forgiven and who will not. Compare Luke 24 verses 46 and 47 which I will read to you. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Witnesses of these things. So again I repeat, not a question of deciding who will be forgiven and who won't. The power, and one more sentence more here, the power given is authority to declare forgiveness on the basis of the death of Jesus. 
the power given, repeating, is the authority to declare forgiveness on the basis of his death. And that authority was to be theirs, and incidentally ours, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That authority was to be then and us because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that authority is given to the whole church, not just to ordained people to ministry. The presence of everyone who has the indwelling Christ in his or her life. Peace is turned to fear. I mean, fear is turned to peace. Sorry. <laughs> now look something else. Certainty takes the place of doubt. Verses 24 to 29. Jesus again appears to his disciples. Verse 24. Now Thomas... He's back now. One of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, can't you hear him say it? Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Thomas was always a skeptic. He wanted evidence. He wanted evidence. Jesus said, um, Touch, invited him, touch the mark in my hands and sighed. It's my conviction, but I can't say it of any authority for it, that he never did so. He just simply saw the nails, saw the mark, and fell at his feet and said, My Lord and my God. Very interesting. Would you just put a wee little cross-reference there? To First Thessalonians, just put it there, First Thessalonians, chapter one. First Thessalonians chapter one and verse seven. First Thessalonians one seven. This oh, mustn't get diverted, but this is the most amazing church in the whole New Testament. It grew so fast. Disciples were only in Thessalonica three weeks and then they were kicked out. But you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Example? Same word. Except I see in his hands the print of the nails. That's the word. You became like the mark of the nails in Macedonia and Achaia. People want evidence. Some evidence for what we believe. Let me see the marks. Got any marks on you? Not necessarily physically, but got some marks to give you away? The evidence that you belong to Jesus. That's what they wanted. That's what people want now. The evidence. Have you no scar? You know that poem by Amy, Ma Amy Carmichael? Tremendous. I hear you hail does mighty in the land but have you no scar what's the evidence 
second day. And so Thomas saw the evidence of a risen Christ. And he fell at his feet, my Lord and my God. One other thing and then we're through. The whole purpose of the gospel in verses 30 to 31. Verses 30 to 31. The whole purpose of the gospel. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The purpose of the Gospel of John in those two verses. Got it? Is that the readers of it should believe in Jesus even though they've never seen him. And let me repeat this and underline it and think back to the hours, few hours that we had in this. Any reading of this gospel I'm speaking at dictation speed. Any reading of this gospel which does not lead to belief in the deity of Christ. Repeating. Any reading of this gospel which does not lead to faith in the deity of Christ and to receiving eternal life is a misreading of it. The principal words of the whole book of John are believe, life. Believe and life. So that though we may not have seen him, yet we love him. Just let me give that to you again because it's so important. That's the purpose of the record, verse 30 and 31. Any reading of this gospel which does not lead to faith in the deity of Christ and the receiving of eternal life is a misreading of it. The principal words in the whole book are believe and life. So that though we have not seen him, we may yet love him. First Peter 1, chapter, verse 8. 